Okay. This is the first bird, the bell bird. Lovely liquid musical notes. Um, now they can sound quite different from this, but they're very tuneful, very melodic. This is the male. The female's slightly drabber with a wee white, little white moustache. Let's listen to this for a wee while because you need to get a sense of how different it is from Tui. If you've already got a koai and a kakabi, why don't you put in a kukianum flax for bellbirds? This is another flower they really love, the nectar from, in the summer. And this is the alarm call of the bellbird. making that racket because of the sewing machine that's creeping up behind them or whatever that other noise is. But. So, bellbirds have got an alarm call that you can sometimes mistake for a blackbird or a song thrush, but there's more of a ring, a strident ring to, um, to a bellbird. Of course, you can easily see there how to distinguish the two birds. Often the um, crown of a bellbird will be purple. Um, a little bit of that can be from its um, iridescent feathers, but often it's the purple pollen of fuchsia, native or introduced fuchsia. Sometimes it's orange around here. I've had a number of people ring up and say, oh, I saw this green bird the other day and it had a red head and I don't know or an orange head, and I don't know what it is. It's a bellbird that's been sticking its head in flax flowers and getting its face covered in pollen. You can see there's yellow and purple pollen on this male. And the bristles around their feathers are very good for catching the pollen and cross-pollinating. Because um, a number of New Zealand native plants, particularly the Metrosideris species, this is a climbing rata, um, depend on birds to cross-pollinate their flowers. Right, let's go to the Tui. It's pretty me me melodic, tuneful, whistles, but it's always got coughs and grunts and croaks and squeaks. You don't ever hear those coughs or those squeaks. Um, from a bellbird. And if you watch a tui singing while this is going on, its mouth's going like this, and you finally realise you're only hearing about 50% of what it's singing because so much of the song is above the frequency, certainly above the frequency that old men can hear, but um, certainly above the frequency that even children can hear. Um, So distinguishing between a bellbird and a tui is really important if you live around Dunedin. That is, those are the two most important birds I think you need to learn if you want to be a um, bird monitor. Practice learning the difference between tui and bellbird. This is a great plant, of course. I think tui co-evolved with kofai. They fit each other like hand and glove. That tui beak fitting into the throat of that flower is just a perfect fit. So these two, two creatures very much rely on each other. So I put starling next because it's another shiny, glossy bird. It doesn't have the white throat patch, but then often a young tui just out of the nest doesn't have a throat tuft either. Um, this guy is bloody difficult because it mimics just about everything else out there. It will mimic an oyster catcher, a harrier hawk. It'll give the alarm call of a blackbird. It'll throw everything at you 
just trying to persuade its partner that it's a great musician and mimic. There is quite a bit of harshness in a starling's call, but it can be very tuneful as well. If you see a tui sitting on the power wires singing with a short tail, you're looking at a starling. Yellow bill, pink legs, particularly in the summer. The female can be a wee bit drabber. So starlings and miners are kept as pets the world over and they're valued because of their ability to mimic. Um, you can teach a starling to speak like a parrot, to say words. They are such good mimics, if you get one young enough. Okay, another dark bird, this one with a longer tail, red beak, the blackbird. If you don't know a blackbird, male blackbird, get up and leave now, please, because... <laughs> but listen to its song. This is tricky compared to a thrush. Melodious, rich, quite a powerful song. It's fantastic to listen to early in the morning. It really, no wonder people brought blackbirds to New Zealand to remind them of England. He knows he's a good singer, he's making us wait. Okay. So, lovely tuneful notes, but always changing, okay? The difference between a blackbird and a song thrush is the song thrush repeats the phrases. If you listen long enough to a song thrush, thinking it's a blackbird, suddenly he'll trip up and he'll start saying the same thing two or three times, and you know you've got a thrush rather than a blackbird. This is a female blackbird, just to confuse things. Um, she's got a speckled breast, but invariably um, she'll have an orangish bill. Sometimes they might be dark if she's a young female, but she's still the colour of coffee with very little milk in it. Okay, If this was a song thrush, she'd be the colour of tea with a lot of milk in it and a beautiful white creamy chest with very clearly defined speckles on it. Here we are. There's the song thrush for you. Let's listen to the song thrush and see if we can hear the phrases being repeated. Quite a bit of repetition. You never hear that with a blackbird. Never. It's quite a nice song, but it's not rich and melodious like a blackbird's. Is. Now, if you heard that in the bush, that could be the alarm call of a blackbird or a thrush. This happens to be a thrush. The blackbird's at a slightly deeper pitch. But that's quite different from the bellbird, which is a more strident, ringing, sort of scolding call. Okay. Quite a loud, ringing cry. Not as loud as we're hearing here. If it was out in the bush, it wouldn't be quite that volume. And of course I've said this is a great plant, the kakabi, for all the winter flowering broom for these little guys, particularly if they're being chased out of the kōwhai trees by the tuis. Um, so silver eyes have got quite a ringing cry, but they also have a whisper song. And chances are, unless you're standing very close to the nest in early spring, you won't hear it because it's a whisper. But it's very much like a little thrush or a blackbird singing. It's a beautiful, tuneful song, but you need to be no further away than from here to the wall from it to even hear it in the forest. Mainly that ringing call of the 
silver eye is what you're going to hear. Now the grey warbler. Quite a tuneful little warble and um, round about now you should be hearing quite a lot of it. Um, it's the males that sing, the females will make the odd little note, contact call, but mainly it's the males that sing. And <clears throat> with an increase in the number of bellbird and tui and kereru in people's backyards, fantails and warblers are kind of taking a backward step really. Um, and this has happened all over the world. When we benefit loud, noisy honey eaters, the insectivores tend to pull out. You can encourage them to stay around by planting appropriate trees or shrubs for them. I tried an experiment and I put a manaka up in by the veggie garden and we're visited by a pair of warblers every day and they spend a good hour checking that tree out before they head back to the bush and forage elsewhere. And we've started noticing that the fantails like the manaka or the kanaka as well. Manaka and kanaka are great plants for um, a lot of our native insects and our insectivores, the wee fantails and the um, grey warblers, um, really depend on and know and rely upon kanaka and manaka shrublands for their foraging. So plant a manaka and they will come. I've noticed grey warblers working along fence lines where there's been Coxville. Coxville? Growing up through years. Well, there must be insects there that may be spiders or something that they're. Grey warblers and fantails. Great, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So they're not the shrubs, they're actually in the. They're in the grassland almost. But they're needing that fence line as, as a perch, I suppose, for foraging. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I think those, they're little perching birds, uh, the warblers and the fantails, so they, they kind of like, although you often see in the wintertime, you'll often see fantails hopping across the ground. I had the incredible experience earlier this winter. I was up in the car wickers on a, on a deer farm, and they had these obscenely heavily branched red deer that American hunters like to shoot that have got 54 points on them instead of the standard 12. So this deer is standing out in the middle of a paddock, not an American hunter to be seen because um, they're not travelling at the moment. And there was a fantail sitting in its rack of antlers. And as the deer moved around, the fantail was using it as its, as its own portable tree and just flying out and catching insects and coming back and sitting in the rack of answers. So I do think they're probably, your um, warblers are probably using the fence line as a kind of horizontal expanded tree for checking out new habitats. Yeah. Dunnock, this is sometimes called the hedge sparrow. It's not a sparrow at all. It's a completely different little bird with a very fine bill for feeding on insects and small seeds. And um, Many of you will have dunnocks in your backyard. Some of you may not even realise you've got them because they're quite secretive. They mind their own business. They tend to, they're called hedge sparrows because they hop around in a quiet, preoccupied fashion underneath hedges and through gardens full of um, perennials and things. And they tend to just mind their own business. But they're exceedingly abundant around Dunedin. They're an introduced bird and they've got a beautiful song. I think. This can be a tricky one because it's a little bit tuneful and so when it comes to question time, this guy is sitting in amongst the bird calls you're going to be listening to and it may very well trip some of you up.
right now the males are singing because it's courtship time. Let's see what a house sparrow sounds like. This is a real sparrow. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Sometimes quite insistent, particularly during courtship, when you see these, what the English used to call sparrow weddings. There'd be a male with his little chest puffed out on the ground, chirp, chirp, chirping, and um, chasing a female sparrow around, trying to convince her that he's a great guy. They've got this black bib, the males, on their chest. It's a very interesting phenomenon because these are all feathers that are produced in the um, autumn when they go into the winter mould. And the black bib is already sitting there, but it, all the tips of the feathers are grey, and through the winter they wear off. They break off, and come the spring, he's got a beautiful black bib that he puffs out and shows off to the female. Let's have a look at the next picture. Of course, the female doesn't have a black bib at all, and all the youngsters look just like mum, really. But they all make the same noise. OK, what's next? Chaffinch. A chaffinch looks like a beautiful sparrow, particularly the males. This lovely, pinky, rusty colour can be quite pink on the chest in a, in a good, mature male. That lovely bluish-grey cap. Um, and on the rump, underneath these wings, uh, quite olive green. And very distinctive white bars on the wings as they fly, both male and female. The female would be brown in most of those places, except for the, the white alabars bars and shoulder patches on the wings. And there's a white tail flash as well. They're quite primitive finches, actually. So they sound different from all the other passerines, all the other introduced finches. This one sounds quite distinctive. This is another sound that the British would have loved to have heard, reminding them of Mo Mother England. It's a beautiful call. So the, just a little bit, I love chaffinches. They're very common in our, they're probably one of the most common introduced passerines in New Zealand. They're right through our beech forests, through our southern beech forests. And in Britain and in Europe, they're a bird of the northern beech forests. And in fact, they're one of the earliest finches. So these guys are not pure seed eaters, like goldfinches and greenfinches and the others. These guys like feeding a lot of caterpillars to their youngsters. So this is a bird that was becoming a finch, really. Um, and it sits in quite a different category from the other finches we've got in New Zealand. And the other finches that we've got, all they're all in the same family group, and their, their calls all sound the same, and it's a hell of a job to try and distinguish between all the others. But the chaffinch, I reckon, we should be able to learn, so that's why we put them in the testable um, group. And this is the other one that I put in there because I think although it's in that group of finches that specialise in feeding their babies seeds instead of insects, and it's got relatives like the red pole and the green finch, um, this one is distinctive enough both in appearance and in sound that you should be able to recognise it in the test. Okay. Tinkly, sort of twinkly, tinkly sort of call. A bubbly, almost bubbly. And it has a lilting flight, like most of the finches, and strong yellow on the wings. This is very distinctive, of course. If you see two of them together feeding, the male will have slightly more red extending behind the eye and on the cheeks than the female will. They've got this beautiful tweezer of a beak for elegantly inserting into the heads of thistles and teasel and... and milk thistles and taking those fine delicate seeds and plucking them almost like with a pair of forceps. They don't like eating dead seed on the ground. They'd rather take them from the delicate flower heads of thistles and teasels really. Beautiful bird.
distinctly delicate, like the bird itself, really. The song is quite delicate. Fantail, let's listen to that. Pretty easily recognisable. The bellbird or something in the background. About one and eight in Otago can be dark. Who's seen a black fantail? It's quite nice when you encounter one, isn't it? It's like good luck or something. Yes. White fantails, that's right. There's a pure white, that one up north near Wanganui at the moment, I think. Yeah. And um, the black fantails sometimes have white sort of ear coverts, but not always. In the North Island, black fantails are far less common. And Manuka, I reckon, is a great plant to encourage fantails. If you want to distinguish between a male and a female fantail, check out their eyebrows if they're standing together. The male Scots bushier white eyebrows. Of course he has. No, that's true. Okay. Kiru, wing flap. You can hear how magnified that sound is, the waterfall or the stream is. And you'll occasionally hear the Kiru calling. I've only heard it once. There. Ooh. Ooh. So, if you're in the forest and there's a pair of pigeons and they've been courting and they have a nest or they're thinking of laying shortly, the male and the female will quietly talk to each other by going, Ooh. Ooh. That's about all you'll hear. So, don't rely on hearing the Kiruru's call when you mark it on your list, you're more likely to hear the wing beats. And in fact, the number of times I've talked to people who have been out doing their bird list and we're chatting away and there'll be a Kiruru above them looking at them and I'll say, have you got Kiruru on your list? No, no, I haven't heard one. And the bird will be just sitting there looking at you. It happens to me all the time. When I go through the forest, um, we've got a circuit in our bush, and I go through the circuit, and I come back um, and go round again. And where I never heard a kiru the first time, I just hear a twig snap or a little flap, and there's been a bird sitting there all the time, quietly watching but not making a noise. So it pays to be vigilant when kiru are around. There are a lot more on the peninsula than people give credit. And again, this is the key plant for Kiru, I think. I do not like magpies. So I, I just want to hijack the entire session and say, they hammer these guys, our dual geckos. Um, so I would rather not see any magpies on the peninsula, despite their beautiful call, which... Dennis Glover, immortalised. Quite distinctive, most of you will recognise the magpie from the poem and from the... They're um, bullies in New Zealand. In Australia, they're kept in their place by a whole lot of raptors and a whole lot of other aggressive butcher birds and things. But here, they'll whack the head off a thrush. They'll eat the lizards and the skinks. Um, they've become bullies in New Zealand. Now, there's probably people in this room that could actually mimic this. We might not even have to play this call. Anyone think they could mimic a shining cuckoo? Yes. That's better sound quality than I've got, and you deserve one of these. I'm dying to open these. Help yourself to one of those, sir. Thank you. That's great. I don't think we even need to listen to that one. Let's just move on. 
Again, this is a great plant for shining cuckoos. We all know, well, most of us know they like eating the woolly bear caterpillars off cinerarius, but there's hairy caterpillars that live on the cold pipe that they like to. Ah, uh, someone else wants a lolly, do they? All right, if you want to come all the way to the front, we can reward you with something. Top marks for initiative. <laughs> there we are. Don't try eating it with your mask on, will you? Okay. That's a baby shining cuckoo. That's that insistent little call that they give when the grey warbler, who's their foster parent, because shining cuckoos lay their eggs in warbler nests, that's the insistent little call that the, um, the chick gives, the quite large chick, probably about three times the size of its warbler parent, um, gives, um, inciting the parent to keep foraging and find enough for the foster parent to find enough food to, to feed the chick. And I, those two kowhai trees in the front of our place, by our veranda where we sit in bed and watch, I've seen up to three shining cuckoos in that tree um, hunting for caterpillars. And on one occasion, round about January, February, when was it? It was about April or May, Alison Balance and I were sitting on the deck and a warbler was in the kowhai tree with a shining cuckoo chick. And the chick was not giving that insistent little call. It was giving the adult warbler call. Sorry, the adult shining cuckoo call, but mum was still coming and feeding it. And I think already it had had a, a kind of mind switch and it was just trying to call for other shining cuckoos and get ready for migrating. But mum was still... Um, the foster mum was still feeding it. And, and another interesting occasion, we were up in near Hamarana Springs in Rotorua one year, and all the cuckoos arrived back. There must have been about 20 cuckoos around Hamarana Springs, all catching the, the mayflies that were um, flying over the water. And there was a pair of grey warblers feeding their chicks in a nest in a cabbage tree right beside the springs. And I thought, this will be interesting because, you know, they'll recognise these 20 parasites all sitting in the trees singing around them and they might mob them or chase them away or at the very least they would want to keep them away from the nest. They weren't the slightest bit phased by the shining cuckoos. They were feeding in the same trees, treating them as if they were totally innocuous. So I don't know that grey warblers even recognise shining cuckoos for the parasite that they are. I think they just totally ignore them and get on fine with them. Surprised me to see that. Here's a hard one. <coughs> um, well, I, ha I haven't distinguished between greys and mallards in this. They, they essentially sound rather similar. Someone's just cracked a joke and one was laughing, but... A duck is a duck, really. I don't think you'll have any trouble with that. This is the male, of course. The female, this was taken at um, Broad Bay in the bank above the beach one year. The females, you can see why they're beautifully camouflaged. She's sitting on a nest in amongst a whole lot of vegetation. If the male had been sitting on the nest, the nest wouldn't have lasted five minutes. But um, beautifully camouflaged. Now, fortunately, or... Unfortunately, depending on your point of view, I think fortunately, paradise ducks. When we came to the peninsula in 1980, there were no paradise duck on the peninsula. Fish and game introduced five pairs, I think, to a little um, inlet over the other side. They, all the birds were pinions so that they couldn't fly away. And I believe all the parries on the peninsula today are descended from those birds, and parries are very common in Dunedin and Otago now. I even see them by the railway lines in town on the little patches of grass there. Male, female, let's see what the call sounds like.
the really loud, raucousy bit is the female, and the honky bit is the male. So they're kind of duet, really. Early settlers were quite confused to find that the most colourful of the two birds was in fact the female, with the white head. A scientist that was working on Parry said to me, he thought the female had a white head so that when the male visits the nest to call the female off, she invariably nests in a hole, either in a tree or a rabbit hole in the bank or some sort of hollow under the rocks. He can see her white head in the darkness and know that the female's on the nest. So that's the thought behind why the female is. Those ducks are shell ducks. They kind of sit somewhere between geese and ducks, our parries. And they have um, not a good digestive system. They can't really handle high cellulose from um, plants. So they tend to favour areas that have been well irrigated. Or um, they're looking for um, pasture that's fresh and green and tender. So there's not so much... Silic um, cellulose in it and so all the irrigators um, right through central and everywhere, people who irrigate their pastures for their stock are just playing right into the Paradise Ducks farm <laughs> and you'll find just about every sort of um, cow trough in every paddock's got its resident pair of parries because they just love that tender grass, that fresh green tender grass. So this is one native bird that's really started to take off, uh, thanks to Fonterra, uh, really. <coughs> um, this is the big blackback seagull that's quite common around the coast and even in town on top of the factory roofs they nest. <coughs> This is a big seagull that's pretty well circumpolar. You can find them in Australia. You can go right round the sub-Antarctic and pretty well close to Antarctica, you'll still find them. They're round the coast of Chile. They're in um, the Falkland Islands and South Georgia. So they're right around the circumpolar region. And um, they are nasty predators. And in fact, in town, my stepdaughters told me that she's seen them killing red-billed gulls on the roofs of um, buildings in town and eating them or tearing them up and feeding them to their chicks. So this is quite an aggressive bird that's on the increase, really. And unfortunately, it's at the expense of our um, endemic gulls. Anyway, that glock, 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 glock is quite different from the red bill gull, which we'll listen to next. I could have put this poor little bird's photograph at the bottom of the black bat gull's picture and said, plant red bill gulls, because black bats will come. But um, this is the smaller gull. This is the gull that's very common at the moment. Um, on the peninsula out at Tyra Head. It's, um, there's a beautiful breeding colony out there every um, summer. In fact, I think it's more of an attraction than the albatrosses, personally. It's certainly more interesting for children to see the gulls feeding their chicks and incubating their eggs and displaying. Um, this is now an endangered species. And in fact, the um, Tyra Head colony is one of the few expanding red bill gull breeding colonies in New Zealand. So we should be grateful for that. Not only that, but this bird is bringing and spreading native plants that were planted by Doc over on the mole. Cook's scurvy grass, which is a rare plant that's been eaten by browsing animals. 
and the seeds of cooked scurvy grass have been picked up on the feet of the Redville gulls out of Tyra Head and carried back to Tyra Head and cooked scurvy grass is now growing in the colony as a natural feature of the Redville gull colonies of Tyra Head. So next summer, if we get back to being COVID free and visitors from other parts of New Zealand come and visit you, take them out to Tyro Head to show them the red billed gulls. You'll be fascinated. And you could also take them to Soldiers Monument to listen to the skylark, which is another one of those birds that the Brits brought to New Zealand because they just love the call. Sky song, of course, it's hovering high up in the sky as it comes down. And in the springtime, Round Soldiers Monument is a great place to hear the, um, the skylark calling. Anywhere where there's pasture, you'll hear skylarks on the peninsula. So they're seed eaters, and they have a little crest on the top of their head, and a slightly shortish tail and they walk or run across the ground. Quite a big body and quite a small head I always think when I see skylarks. This is a bird that was introduced from England and next we listen to the pipit which is the other bird that you might be confused with. So it looks very much like a skylark the pivots are members of the wagtail group, so they tend to wag their tail as they run along. And you won't really see pivots on the peninsula on sheep paddocks or in pasture. They tend to be at the back of the beach, go down to Allen's Beach, and at the base of the dunes, running along, eating in amongst the kelp or that, you'll find the pivot. It has a distinctive song as well, but this is not a song we'll test you on today, so relax. Almost getting skylarkish, but not doesn't quite make the grade, does it? So these birds I've just put in for interest because you may encounter them on the peninsula, or you may encounter their calls, but I wouldn't dream of testing you on it. So let's listen to the Ti oli oli ho, or Willoughby, 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 as some people described it as before sound recording. Still a few tomtits around Portobello here in the um, Karnaka Forest. We occasionally see them at the Cove, which is much closer to town, in the um, late summer after they fledge. So they can turn up pretty well. Marcia had a record this year, didn't you, of over near Tomahawk, yeah, Shield, Hill. Shield Hill. So the youngsters particularly get about. I'm afraid they're probably cleaned up by cats, the young ones. But So this is a close relative of the goldfinch. Lots of them on the peninsula. I saw a flock of about 20 at our place the other day. Flocks of up to 400. In the golf course. Yeah. That's passerines for you. The, the little introduced passerines often flock in the winter, and sometimes really big flocks. <coughs> um, they're usually more sparrow coloured than this one. This is a particularly um, nicely marked um, male. Sometimes they're pinkish rather than reddish. Um, and the females have very little red and mainly sparrow coloured. Um, and I know it's important for you to record that you've heard red poles on the peninsula. 
but the call is really quite hard and I'd rather you concentrated on getting some of those natives sorted first before you move into really distinguishing these guys. You could always put down Finch question mark if you hear, because it's better to put down that you're not sure than to put the wrong species down so that you look cool when you heard it. This is some um, green finch again. There's some qualities to the call that help distinguish it, but I won't test you on this. This bird often calls from the power wires or from a fence in a paddock. Female's slightly less green than that, but still has the yellow flash on the tail. To be perfectly frank, I don't know that red pole numbers or green finch numbers are going to be going up or down as a result of possums being removed from the peninsula. This Z is quite distinctive, but it can be confused with a yellow hammer, really. Chweel, chweel, chweel. Again, fence lines, power lines, rural areas usually, not in the bush. This is the bird that um, one of the British birders described as a little bit of sugar and no tea. A little bit of sugar and no tea. You need a fairly active imagination. See, it's quite... This one and the green finch can be very, very confusing for people. <laughs> Right, well we'll throw just a few more in so that we can say, yeah, I know what that sounds like, but um, you won't be tested on this. This is the... But quite often they'll fly over. So you might hear a distant call as you're doing bird notes. You're standing in the bush and a swan flies over from the harbour to the other side, to tomahawk or vice versa. That's when you're going to hear ducks. You might hear oyster catchers doing that, or harrier hawks, and you're in the bush, and you're thinking, what forest bird is that? So do consider that it might be a gull flying overhead. That sort of bugly call is quite often what you hear on the wing when they're flying. Or it could be someone learning to play a, a clarinet or a trumpet nearby. Okay. A few kingfishers on the peninsula, um, particularly around the Portobello region. Um, and they'll hunt in the forest as well as out on the coast. So it's not unusual to encounter a kingfisher call in the, in the summer. They quite often nest around here in clay banks, but they'll also choose rotten trees, a tree stump. Pretty distinctive. I've gone off kingfishers. We have got on top of possums pretty well. We still get the odd one. We keep the rats under control. I'm starting to feel really good last summer. I was standing in the kitchen on the phone, talking to a friend from Auckland, two kingfishers sitting on the power pole, power wires down to the letter box, and I'm thinking, oh, that's nice. And um, we planted some um, nasty tree nettle to encourage red admiral butterflies. And I'm sitting there 
chatting to Graham on the phone, and one of my personally reared butterflies flies up over the power wires, one of the kingfishers takes off, hawks it in mid-air, brings it back down, beats the hell out of it, and swallows it. And when they're not doing that, they're sitting on our, power, on our um, clothesline right above our skink garden, watching for any skink that's silly enough to stick its head out from the tussocks. So we've actually swapped a suite of introduced predators for, you know, if it wasn't a kingfisher, it would be a moorpork or a falcon. So life goes on. But anyway, good food for kingfishers. If you hear that coming from a bank or from a hollow tree, baby kingfishers. Quite often used to hear it coming from the bank at Broad Bay when we took the kids swimming it in the summertime down by the cemetery. You'd hear this coming from a hole in the bank. Not the sort of bird the English would have brought to New Zealand to remind them of home, I don't think. Just in case any of you are as lucky as um, Sean was this year, Unmistakable, isn't it? I do hope we start hearing this at night on the peninsula again. This is a native bat. This picture was taken up in Puriora Forest in the North Island. Not Puriora, Rangatawa Forest in the North Island. This is a fascinating night. <clears throat> there were a colony of bats nesting in a tree and we'd been making a documentary about them and we'd gathered round this tree because the scientist had told us the young bats would be leaving that night and who should be sitting in the trees nearby but mum and dad moorpork with three young moorporks who were not skilled at hunting but the baby bats were not skilled at sort of eluding clumsy moorporks and so it was open slaughter that night really but it was a great night for the baby moorporks to learn how to hunt and it amazed me how synchronised the breeding of moorporks and bats was in Rangatawa Forest that, that one would benefit from the emergence of the other right you might hear this overhead while you're doing your bird call um, notes in the forest somewhere, this tends to be when harriers are courting Males skyping to the female. Any possums we catch on our property in the winter time, we peg out on a big tree stump up the back, and the harriers come down and and eat them. I think it's kind of divine retribution, really. Very different from the next guy. Big broad wings, exposed fingertips at the end of the wings. Big broad splayed wings a broad fan tail as they're flying that helps distinguish a harrier from a falcon and there are one or two falcons on the peninsula now so the falcon's got quite a different profile really when you're looking at it more pointed wings and a long straight tail and a flight that reminds me very much of a pigeon actually okay <laughs> More common in the hinterland and the tussock grasslands inland, but we are getting falcons out on the peninsula now, and even around town. They sometimes come in and perch on top of the, of the parrot aviaries and botanic gardens. Hopefully, way back, you know, when they started breeding kaka at Orokanui, the odd bird was coming over here. I know Lala had them coming to eat the... One was coming to her walnut tree and eating her green walnuts. And I saw one circling over the cove once, but that was about five or six years ago. But as their numbers build up, I'm sure they will come. They can have a melodious whistle or a harsh kaka like screech. Quite an unusual call for a parrot, I reckon. Um. 
It's interesting, in the last week or two I've been hearing this call at the cove, and I was convinced it was a kaka. <coughs> but someone said there's some people up the hill that have got lorikeets in a big aviary, and um, from a distance it sounds a bit kaka like. Beautiful bird. Beautiful bird. This is an Australian. Which you will hear quite commonly from winter onwards, really. They're very early nesters. Farmland, but the call carries. And if a harrier flies over, you're likely to hear this going on up in the sky above you. Okay. You don't often hear herons except at nesting time if one flies up and lands in the macrocarpa trees and has decided it's going to build a nest there you might hear a bit of this. <laughs> so again it's something to be aware of when you're recording bird call. If you're near macrocarpa, a shelter belt or something and there's White. It's not a bird you would think of in relationship to macrocarpa trees, but that's often what goes on.